Where can I find hope? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Pursuit, a Cross Point City Church podcast that pursues a deeper dive into the scripture from last week's sermon. I'm Carlos Fernandez, and I'm here with our lead pastor, James Griffin. How you doing, man? I'm tired. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Easter was awesome, but it was a lot. It was awesome, but it was a lot. Yeah, yeah. man. I uh, I was texting a group of my buddies last night from around the country, mm-hmm. all pastoring different churches, and we were talking about how many gatherings and how many times we preached, and uh, I, I definitely didn't preach as many as some of my other dudes. Listen, man, I got one guy in my group yeah. 14 times. 14. I'm like, bro, what is wrong with you? <laughs> They make video for a reason, man. Man. You use that. But uh but no, a lot of us that preached were were probably somewhere in the five to seven, five to eight range. Mm-hmm. So I preached six out of our thirteen gatherings this weekend. And man, it's it's always incredible. I always love Easter. It's yeah. it's one of my favorite weekends of the year. But bro, it is exhausting. Yeah, we're recording this on Monday morning. Yeah. And uh so if I look tired to those of you who are watching on video, it's because I am. Okay. <laughs> Got coffee in hand, ready yeah. to go. Yeah. This, this might be a little bit more laid back than normal. Man, that's okay. <laughs> that's but, but okay. Easter, man. You wanna talk about it? Yeah, man. Easter was awesome. I wanna tell you you did a good job. I'm not gonna lie. Appreciate it. Um you. I thought our, our worship was just awesome, man. The songs that we mm-hmm. picked were amazing. I, I did hear somebody say also shout out to Brad for Good Friday. I know all the locations pastors yeah. preached on Good Pastor Friday. Brad, but I heard Jason great. Lane. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. So great things, man, just all around. And the fact that so mm-hmm. many people showed up. Mm-hmm. You know, it was amazing. And and we don't do it for the crowd, but uh, I just think that when you think of such a big number of people that came out, they yeah. got to hear the gospel. Well, that's the, that's the thing, bro. I mean, yeah. it was it was an historic weekend. Mm-hmm. We had the most people in church we've ever had in church, in the history of our church. Mm-hmm. 6,483 people mm-hmm. showed up to Easter. Praise God. It's amazing. Uh, but to your point, the more important thing is that 6,483 people heard the gospel. Mm-hmm. Not that we had big crowds filling rooms everywhere, yeah. but that that every person that showed up, I mean, this is a person, this is a life. Mm-hmm. Those numbers represent individuals who are all in need of God's grace and the fact that they walked through our doors and they got to hear the story of the gospel. We praise God for that, man. And yeah. and we heard some pretty incredible stories, man. There was, I think it was night one or night two, Thursday or Friday night, we had a grandfather here with his family, man, gave his life to Jesus on mm-hmm. the spot. Told one of our pastors after the gathering, he's like, what James just talked about, like being dead but not truly living, he said, that's me. And I need to give my life to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Uh, we had a, a family who came to see a friend get baptized. Yeah. Their 10-year-old daughter, who is the friend of the friend, gives her life to Jesus mm. after she sees her friend get baptized. Like, that's the kind of stuff that that matters. We baptized 25 people over the weekend. That's awesome. Uh, but, uh, no better weekend to get baptized than Easter weekend, right? Yeah. And, and but, but putting their faith and trust in Christ on display, it was insane, man. Just incredible. We were talking before the podcast, too, about meeting all these people that had had like traveled in from different from places. Different, that was crazy. Wasn't it? Yeah, that was, this is awesome. Yeah. The fact that people are driving to hear, yeah. you know, the gospel being preached and they were excited to be here. I love it yeah. when people are excited about Easter. Yeah. And it's just, it, it excites me. So, yeah. It was and, good stuff. And, and it should, right? Yeah. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. He has risen. But, you know, Carlos, the beauty of our faith is that we get to celebrate that not just on Easter Sunday, but every day, mm-hmm. that that our king is alive, ruling and reigning over all things uh, because of what he's done. We have life. We have hope. But but it is special, man, on, on Easter just to get everybody together yeah. and to celebrate that in a very intentional way. Yeah, and shout out to, to everybody. I mean, my gosh, we had serve team members that were here all weekend serving yeah. multiple gatherings. Uh, we had worship leaders here serving multiple gatherings throughout the course of the weekend, people helping out with our Good Friday gatherings. Like I, I just want to give a shout out to our staff, our team, our serve team, anybody that played a part. Like You were a part of what God did this weekend, and so yeah. I hope you take joy in that. 
And you're awesome. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Man, I love our church. I do too. Okay? Man, we just got good people. So yeah, if yeah. you served, I mean, if you, you were part of the weekend in any way, man, just thank you. Because it couldn't have been done without you. That's right. You know? So That's right. We, man, you guys are awesome. Man, we love you guys. Yeah. So, but the amazing thing is, too, that people came from all different places. Biggest weekend we've ever had. And you talked about sin <laughs> you know it's like yeah. something like if you're trying to attract people you're not just going to talk about <laughs> sin and then you said hey yeah. if you're living this way you're dead <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> ain't that crazy very attractional easter message right yeah. yep but i love it that yeah. we yeah. talked about actually the truth of what's actually going on in the lives of people That's you right. know so let's talk about yeah. sin you specifically okay. said that sin brings death and i yeah. think that we can kind of like break that down a little bit more yeah. this morning so yep yeah let's talk about it man uh Preached Romans 6 mm -hmm. for Easter, just an unbelievable passage. And I said to some people over the course of the weekend, you know, it, it amazes me that the Apostle Paul wrote this in the first century. And so if you, if you have any doubts that the Word of God is divinely inspired, go read the book of Romans. I think that'll clear it up. Like, yeah. you know, a guy just doesn't come up with that stuff on his own. But, yeah. but the way he constructs this argument in the passage we looked at is so, so brilliant. But but yeah, we talked about the reality of sin and sin bringing forth death and how it, it doesn't just bring forth death in the end, but it brings forth death now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things that I always like to do for people when we talk sin is define it because I think there's so many misunderstandings when yeah. it comes to sin. So the way that I said it in the sermon yesterday to start was that sin is when we as creatures attempt to rule in place of creator God. Mm -hmm. The other way that I often say it, this is probably language that most of our people are familiar with, it is when we ignore God in the world that he made. Mm -hmm. That the world and everything in it is his, it belongs to him, it exists for his glory, and sin is when we would say we see that and we recognize that, but we're just going to live our lives how we're going to live our lives. Yeah, All guilty of that. And according to the word of God, the penalty for that is death. Mm -hmm. and so a lot of times when, when we talk about death, we go all the way to the end, you know, and we start talking physical death, which, yes, that is true. Yeah, We'll all die physically one day because of our sin. Mm -hmm. it, it is the proof that people are born into the world as sinners. Mm -hmm. Original sin is a thing, you know, and, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, and and I think it's worth mentioning again that if, if you look at even the death of babies, for example, these, these people that come into the world and, and we would say they're perfect and they're pure and they're innocent, the fact that at times, very sadly, even babies would pass mm. proves the fact that as human beings, we are born into the world with sin natures, mm. okay? So we, we've got to recognize that. But in addition to physical death, there's also spiritual death, mm. and this is eternal separation from God. But as human beings, we're all going to spend eternity somewhere, yeah. either in heaven in the presence of God or in hell separated from the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the choice is ours. Yeah. And the way that I said it in the sermon is that the person who rejects God in this life will be rejected by God in the next. Mm -hmm. And so the penalty of sin is death, but there's a present reality to this, right? Mm -hmm. That even while we're living here on earth, that our sin brings death to certain things. Yeah. And so I think about, Carlos, all the times that I have sat with married couples in our church mm. and their marriage is falling apart. And the key yeah. problem always is sin. sin. <laughs> you got a husband want to do life his way or a wife want to do life her way and they're not doing it God's way. And, and because sin has entered the marriage, what that sin is doing is it's bringing forth death to the marriage. Mm -hmm. This is what divorce is. It's... It's when sin kills a marriage, okay? Um, you see it in friendships, you know? When two friends who've walked together and, and, you know, they've done a lot of life together, all of a sudden something happens and one sins against the other and all of a sudden that sin kills the friendship. Yeah, It's what sin does, man. It, it brings forth death. Mm -hmm. I even think about in terms of, of, of health, you know? Mm -hmm. You could talk about physical health. Like people can make decisions, sinful decisions, with drugs, with alcohol, with sexual immorality mm -hmm. that will impact their physical health and bring about death. Mm -hmm. It's all a result of sin. I would say the same is true mentally, emotionally. 
And so this is what sin does. It, it, it kills all sorts of things, okay? Yeah. Now, what I wrote down here is that I think it is our inability to stop these things from happening that should signal our need for a savior. Mm -hmm. So yesterday we shared this powerful story in our, in our gatherings. Mm -hmm. My dude, Brandon, I was actually texting with Brandon just this morning, man, and I'm gonna give a shout out to him as well. I mean, it takes a lot of courage and humility for a guy to share a story like that. Yeah. To just go back and talk about addiction and affairs and pornography and sexual sin and the whole deal, you know, blowing his family up. But I was texting with him this morning, just going, bro, that is a beautiful picture of the grace and power of God. Like what happens when a man finally surrenders to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and is like, okay, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like me doing it my way is, is wrecking things. I need to do it your way. And just the fact that Jesus pulled him out of that. But the same applies to all of our lives, you know? It's like when, when you look at, at what's dying in your life right now, whether it is a relationship, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, wh whatever it is, when you look at what's dying in your life right now, and you understand, I can't save myself out of that. I can't just put in work and fix this on my own, mm -hmm. but what I need is the God of the universe to enter in and to save me out of it. The, the reality of sin bringing forth death to those certain areas of our lives, again, should signal our need for a savior. Yeah. We need someone outside of us to do for us what we can't do. And as we talked about all weekend long, it's Jesus. Yeah that he saves us not only from the penalty of sin, but even presently saves us from the power of sin. Yeah, no, that's good. That's yeah. really good. So I had a funny like image of this. this okay, morning. all was, right, let's hear it. I was thinking about it and I was like, so I wrote down that sin destroys everything in its path, mm -hmm. right? So sin is just like a destroyer. Yeah. But uh, I used to play this game when I was little. It's called Rampage. I don't know if you've ever played it. Oh yeah, with the gorilla on the yeah. building. <laughs> yeah, bro. So I know this. It was a uh, so the whole premise of the game are these humans who are made into these monsters, yeah. and they go on a rampage. And if you see the description on Wikipedia, it destroys everything from everything on Earth to space and time, and it just keeps going. And so I think sin makes us monsters. I mean, mm. we just go on a on a rampage. We destroy That's everything. Good. Yep, yep. And. Uh, and, and like you said, we need somebody else to come in. So if sin makes us monsters, Jesus wants to make us sons and daughters, mm, you know? It's and good, it's just man. a big difference. Yeah. That, um, but just understanding that sin does affect everything, yeah. everything. Like yeah. it, it, And it's not going to stop. We think, uh, I was reading something this morning, um, if you think that you can sin in a corner, yeah. And it not affect everything else in your house right, in right, your right. life. It, yeah. it, that's a lie, and that's straight from hell. You know, I mean, straight from the devil that yep. he's telling you, you could do this, and it's not going to affect anything else. That's right. Terrible. He's so good at convincing us that that we are islands unto ourselves. Yeah. When we are not. Mm -mm. And you even hear it in our culture today. That's like you know, and people even ask like, well, what does it matter if I'm not hurting anybody? <laughs> <laughs> okay, bro. Like you need to be careful with that. Yeah. You are believing a lie. Mm-hmm. Your behavior will have ripple effects. Yeah, and, always. And all, always, always. And it doesn't matter what you're doing; it's going to have ripple effects. But I would even say to the person who would ask a question like that, God is somebody. Mm. So even if you feel like your behavior is not affecting anyone else around you, well, what about the God who created you? Mm. That's I a mean, good you, you got to take Him into consideration. Yeah, I, is my behavior grieving Him? Is my behavior angering him is is my behavior in alignment with how he created me to live or is it not like god gets a say in the matter mm -hmm. <laughs> he is creator you are creature you have been designed to do life his way for his glory and you're good and so at some point you've got to stop and ask that question yeah how is this affecting god you know mm -hmm. so i i'll say this one other thing too man because i felt like this is important um you know talking about the penalty of sin being death I would just say to people as well to remember that the only thing that's keeping us alive right now as sinners is God's common grace. Mm. And, and Jesus talks about this in the New Testament, how God causes the sun to rise on both the good and the evil mm -hmm. and his rain to fall on both the just and the unjust. Um, Jesus says in the Gospels that God is kind to even wrongdoers, evildoers, okay? Mm. And so the fact is God has this common grace for all people, for all of creation, it's the only reason that that we're breathing and alive right now is because of that grace. And God gives us common grace so that we have time to respond to his special grace, which is seen in Jesus Christ, mm. his son, right? Yeah. And so the fact 
Like if God wanted to, the point I'm trying to make is this, if God wanted to, he could take us out right now for being sinners, but he doesn't. No, because he loves us. <laughs> and instead, God, in whom we live and move and have our being, is keeping us alive and giving us what we need for daily life in hopes that we might repent and turn to faith in Christ and surrender his lordship and follow him. And so he has extended a special grace and he's giving us time to respond to that as people. So I, I would just preach my Easter sermon again and say to the person, if you need to respond, man, respond. Mm -hmm. If you need to give your life to Jesus and come alive and stop living as a dead person and come to faith and experience the life that God has for you, that is the invitation to you Yeah, no, to, to awesome. present yourself to Jesus just as you are so that he can take hold of you and, and make you a new person. Yeah. Now, I was thinking this morning that what would compel God to do that? Yeah. And it's just because he He is love. Like that, that you got to understand is. that, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so when people, like it's not something that you've done. You can't earn it. You can't, you don't deserve it. Right. And there's nothing that you could do to, to you know, get God to look at you, he right. already loves you. And that's yeah. why he's done this for us. And I just think, man, a lot of people, me included, at times, we forget that. Yeah. You know, like yeah. we think we're we're doing something for God. No, no, God has done something for us. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. so. It's a good word. It's just amazing. Um, but then we have this idea, or not this idea, we do have a lot of people who they hear this, sin is death, right? They've surrendered their lives to Jesus, and yeah. now they still feel that sin has a hold in their life. Like yeah. sin just has power. Yeah. And I think this is a huge thing because, I mean, the whole sermon was pretty much, hey, the people who know Jesus, you got to start living like you know him, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the people who don't, man, this is an opportunity for you to come to know him and also live under his power and his reign under right. then the power of sin. Yeah. And so what happens when that doesn't feel like, like I don't feel like I have, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if a believer is there and they're saying, I, I just don't feel like I've lost, you know, I feel like p sin still has its power over me. Yep, yep. Like I'm still addicted to those things. I still can't say no to those things. Right, like what, right. what do we do? Yeah, great, great question, man. And, you know, I, I framed all this yesterday or I, should, I say yesterday. Yeah. It's the most recent day. Yeah. Over the course of the last several days as I yeah. preach Romans 6, uh, I, I framed it by talking about this theological concept called union with Christ that Paul touches on in the text. Mm -hmm. And it's just the idea that if we know him, we've been united to him by faith. Mm -hmm. And everything that's true for Christ is now true for us. So his mm -hmm. life is our life. His death is our death. His resurrection is our resurrection. And so ultimately what that means, according to Paul, is that, is that the old self, who we were before we knew Christ, has died. Mm -hmm. That person is no more, okay? When the old self was alive, that old self was enslaved to sin, ruled by sin, mastered by sin, dominated by sin. Mm -hmm. But in the moment of faith, that old self was crucified with Christ and a death took place. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just talked about the finality of death to illustrate this. You know, when a person dies physically, anything that plagued them in life, they're instantly set free from. Mm -hmm. whether it was the cancer, the physical pain, the financial issues, whatever it was, in, in the moment that they breathe their last, it's over. Yeah. And so Paul's saying that the same is true in a spiritual sense for the believer in Christ, that, that in the moment of faith, what, what happens is that old person breathes his last, if you will, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that the old self is crucified with Christ, that, that the new self is resurrected with him. We become new creations in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that old master called sin, we are instantly free, hmm. instantly in the moment of faith. To your point, it doesn't always feel like that. What it, what it feels like at times is that we're still enslaved. What it feels like at times is that we're still in bondage. I mean, that is the human experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are feeling creatures. We're not just thinking creatures, okay? And, and this is why people know all the right things to do, yet they don't do it because they feel certain ways. Mm -hmm. And this is the danger, though, of trusting in your feelings is that your feelings can lie to you. All the time. And your feelings can lead you down very dangerous roads if you allow your feelings to take you there. Mm -hmm. And so there's this constant tension that we live in between what we know is true and then what we feel to be mm -hmm. true, okay? Now, the reason that we feel that the truth is that we are still under the power of sin at times is because number one, we have a broken part of us called our flesh mm -hmm. that feels this draw towards sin, mm -hmm. okay? 
And so I, I said it over the weekend, you just gotta know there is a part of you that does not want good things for you. Mm -mm. It is the broken part of who you are, the unredeemed part of who you are. It's gonna be with you over the course of your entire life and you have to war against it. Mm -hmm. but, but there is a part of you that, that, that is constantly working to draw you away from God and towards sin. And so if you're like, I feel like I'm crazy, you're normal, okay? Yeah. You're a normal Christian. I think what Paul says in Romans chapter seven, it's like, I do the things I don't wanna do and then I don't do the things that I wanna do. And yeah, yeah, that's because of the flesh, okay? And so that's factor one. Factor two is the devil, that we have a very real enemy, mm -hmm. Satan, and all of his little demonic minions who are constantly working against us and oppressing us and lying to us and accusing us and tempting us. And, and what Satan wants us to believe is that the old master called sin still reigns. Mm -hmm. that, that sin is still seated on the throne of our lives, dominating us and controlling us when Christ says, no, mm -hmm. it doesn't. The old master is no more. I'm your new master. I'm ruling. I'm reigning. I'm calling the shots. I'm controlling. But Satan wants to convince us otherwise, okay? The third factor is the world. Mm -hmm. And this is the worldly system that is, is currently under the influence of satanic control and the world's messaging is that we should give in to our flesh. Yeah. That, that we should indulge the broken part of us that wants to do things that are contrary to God and his way of life. Mm -hmm. And so we have these three things stacked up against us and all of it does is it just kind of like stokes those old desires. Mm -hmm. it, it all stokes those sinful desires. And so on certain days or in certain moments when you wake up and you go, well, I don't feel like I'm free from the power of sin. Well, of course you don't because you're, you got a part of you that's lying to you. You have the devil that's lying to you and you have the world that's lying to you, telling you something that is not true. Mm -hmm. And because you're a feeling creature, not just a thinking creature, those subjective feelings at times can take over and, and can lead you back into slavery, if that yeah. makes sense, okay? And so I, I would say to the person who feels that way, if you truly wanna live in the freedom that belongs to you, the first thing you have to do is you have to believe that you are free, okay? Mm. Let, let me say it like this, belief is a choice, okay? So this is where we have to turn our brains on and think. We have to forget about how we feel in moments and we've just gotta think. And we have to ask ourselves the question, what, what does God say is true? And what do I know to be true because of what Christ has done for me? Yeah. What does the gospel say is true? Well, well, the gospel says I'm free mm -hmm. and I'm not the old person anymore. I'm a new person. I've been resurrected. I'm a new creation. I don't have to obey the old master. Mm -hmm. that, that's what's true. Yeah. And so at a point, you've got to make a conscious decision to actually believe that. Yeah. I was talking to a woman about it yesterday in our church and, and she showed up and, oh my gosh, she's such a sweet lady. And I, took, I, I talked to her in the lobby for a few minutes and she said it was no mistake that I was here today. And she said, I've, I've just been struggling with what you were preaching on. And she said, I got to start believing what's actually true. Yeah. And so she said, will you pray for me? And I was like, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit of God would give you exactly what you need to just believe this, you know. Mm -hmm. That's number one. You yeah. got to believe it. Step number two, you have to die to yourself every day. Mm -hmm. And so this is a matter of you crucifying your flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit that is within you. Galatians 5.16, Paul says that, if we walk by the spirit, we will not gratify the desires of our flesh. And so we have to be people who, who wake up every day and we go, okay, I'm, I'm aware. I know there's a part of me that doesn't want good things for me. Mm -hmm. And if I give into that part of me, it will draw me away from God toward the old master that is sin and sin will bring forth death in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, instead of that, I'm just gonna go ahead and put that to death. Instead of allowing sin to produce death in me, I'm gonna put my flesh to death and I'm gonna do that by working in partnership with the Holy Spirit who gives me power to crucify the flesh. Yeah. And so this is a matter of faith, it's a matter of humility, it's a matter of you laying your life before the Spirit of God each day and saying, I need you to do this for me. I know I, I can't put the flesh to death on my own, but, but you can. Mm -hmm. And so Spirit of God, would you give me the power that I need in this moment and then all throughout the day to say no to the flesh because I understand that sin is no longer my master 
and give me what I need to live a life that would honor my new master, Jesus, yeah. okay? That's number two. That and, then number, and then number three, you follow the teachings of Jesus, mm -hmm. okay? You follow the teachings of Jesus. As I say often, it is the teachings of Jesus that realign us with God's way of life. Mm -hmm. And so when we follow him, what that means is that we're set free. Mm -hmm. When we follow the commands of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, we don't become slaves. Yeah, I think that's the lie that a lot of people believe. You know, It's like, well, if I do what he wants me to do, I'm not free anymore. Oh, my friend. <laughs> yeah, you are. You're, you're more free than you could ever realize. Mm -hmm. Because freedom, by definition, is not you doing what you want to do. It's you living how you're meant to live. And the commandments and teachings of Jesus realign you with how God has designed you to live. And so when you do life his way, it frees you. Yeah. It frees you. It brings so much joy and satisfaction to your life. And so, again, for the person who's like, I don't feel like I don't feel free, you are. You got to believe it. Crucify your flesh daily by the power of the Holy Spirit. Walk according to the ways of Jesus, and sin will lose all of its power in your life. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, that's literally what I wrote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I wrote down, like, I was thinking about Matthew 24 when Jesus says, hey, if you want to be one of my followers, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Yeah. And so that's the pattern that you just said. Right. Deny yourself. Yep. Say no to you, yep. right? Like, yep. you are not leading you to in the right spot. Yep. So don't follow your heart. Don't follow your feelings. Your feelings are going to lie. And then pick up your cross. And I was just thinking, like, when you pick up a cross, there's no going back. That's right. You know, yeah. Yeah, uh, everybody that had a cross at that time was a dead man. A death is about to occur. Yeah. So just understand that you are crucifying the flesh. Like, mm. you, And I love the way the, the word in crucify is actually like suffocating it. Mm. You're suffocating the flesh. Yeah, You're not allowing it to breathe. Yeah, You're not yeah. giving it food. You're not feeding it. <laughs> You're not entertaining it. Choking the life out of it. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to get into that mode. And right. then you have to follow Jesus. I love the fact that the early Christians, they were actually followers of the way. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We just say, hey, you're a Christian and you believe and you go to church. No, no, no. You got to follow Jesus. That's Following right. Jesus impacts every single day. That's right. Okay? Not just going to church on Sunday. And you'll see freedom mm -hmm. because when you follow Jesus, you are in Christ. That's you know, right. you're doing the things that he wants you to do. But also, you're participating in things where you get to experience or you get to put your, your, your body into places and atmospheres where you get to grow. Yeah. You get to be fed. I mean, there's just so many different things. And so... Yeah. You'll find freedom as you follow Jesus, as that's you right. walk that's with right. him, you know, be close to him. Yeah. And so Well that I, that's a good word even on belief, like what yeah. you just said. You know, I think so many people misunderstand belief. Yeah. Well, they just and think it's up here. That's exactly you know? right, bro. It's like, oh well, as long as I agree with certain ideas, yeah. No. I have believed. No, you have not, man. You know, biblical faith or belief is comprised of three factors or three components. It's about knowledge, I know what's true. Mm -hmm. It's about assent, I agree that what I know to be true is actually true. And then it's commitment, mm -hmm. that I am committing my life to what I know to be true. And what that looks like is what you just talked about. It looks like me following Jesus yeah. in surrender. Yeah. And so you have not fully believed until you've started to follow. Mm -hmm. And then when you follow, it sets you free. But, I, man, I love that word about just choking out the flesh, man, yeah. suffocating the flesh. That's yeah. good, man. Yeah, don't feed it. Don't picture. entertain yeah. it. So, no, but that's good. I love it. I love the fact that we're actually calling people to more. Yeah. We're not just saying, hey, church, you, you can come to church and you can sing a song and you can do all this stuff. But to be honest, the freedom that Jesus is going to give you is with you when you walk with him on a daily basis. That's exactly right. And, and just try it. You'll find freedom if you walk with Jesus. Yeah. You know, if you go and you pray and you yeah. read your God's word. I mean, you will see freedom. That's the Holy Spirit will begin to work. Okay. Don't go to the things that you know are gonna hurt you. Right. So right. It's good. Um, but then you also talked about our future hope. And I love the way you kind of put this because hope isn't heaven but resurrection. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I thought that was kind of unique because a lot of people, we we talk about heaven. Like we mm. can't wait for heaven. We can't <laughs> wait for all these things. But right. the way you spend it was kind of different. So let's break that down a little bit. Yeah. Well, when I, I when people talk about heaven, I think they have a certain idea in their mind mm -hmm. that as a, as a preacher and as a pastor, I want to continue pushing on. Mm -hmm. Because as Christians, we believe certain things about eternity Mm. that really contradict a lot of the misconceptions that exist within our society and even church culture at large these days, okay? Yeah. 
you know, I, it's crazy. I, I remember I preached uh, an Easter sermon a few years ago called Heaven is Not Our Home, all right? Mm. Just, you know, and I, I titled it that on purpose. I just yeah, wanted yeah. to kind of get the wheels spinning and, and get people a little curious. Heaven is not our home. And I talked about this, that the ultimate hope of the believer is in heaven as most people think about it, but future resurrection. Mm -hmm. I think the common misconception, even in the minds of church people, is that when we die, body goes in the ground, soul goes in the presence of God, and it's done. Mm -hmm. And that we just exist as disembodied creatures in some floaty place forever, as I often like to call it, you know? Yeah. And, and we're just kind of there, existing in that form and fashion. And, and I think a lot of people are like, that's heaven. That's heaven, okay? Now, I, I will say heaven, when you study it in the scriptures, is the dwelling place of God. Mm -hmm. It is where the resurrected Jesus of Christ, uh, resurrected Jesus, excuse me, is seated on the throne of heaven right now in present time, ruling and reigning over all things. Yeah. When, when we die, our souls do go there mm -hmm. to that place, the dwelling place of God, which we would call heaven. Mm -hmm. But we don't stay there like that forever, okay? I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But, okay. but in that Easter sermon, I can remember when I was talking about all this, uh, we're streaming it online, and I'm talking about the concept of resurrection, mm -hmm. right? And there was a girl who posted in the comments, is this guy talking about reincarnation? Which again, just alerted me to the fact that a lot of people misunderstand what we as Christians believe about eternity. Mm -hmm. I was teaching at a church recently and I was talking about, um, I was talking through the gospels. That was my assignment. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the end of the gospel of, of Matthew and Mark, I'm talking about future resurrection, and, you know, the hope of the believer. And I had a girl come to me after one of the classes and she's like, hey, can you, can you say that resurrection part again? I don't know if I've ever heard that. So just ran back, through, which again alerted me to the fact that a lot of people don't understand what we as Christians ultimately believe about eternal things. And so I just thought I would walk through the sequencing yeah, do it. of it and then we can talk hope and why we have hope because of this, okay? Yeah. So number one, as mm -hmm. I said a moment ago, when a believer in Christ dies, the soul of the person immediately goes into the presence of God. Okay. Second Corinthians 5, 7, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, mm -hmm. okay? So as people, we, we, are, we are body and soul, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, we are immaterial and we are material, and both parts of the human person matters. Okay. I think we've got to go, get away from language like, oh, I'm a, I'm a soul with a body. Because I think what comments like that do is, is it devalues the body, and the body is very, very important within Christianity. Mm -hmm. We know from the beginning that God created us to be embodied creatures. Mm -hmm. We know that when we look toward the end, right, to, to the redemption of all things, that we will live in physical bodies for all of eternity. Yeah. And then we are instructed in present time to honor God with our bodies. Mm -hmm. The fact that Jesus took on a physical body and that he right now exists and lives in a physical body mm -hmm. should alert us to the fact that, oh, our bodies matter to God. Yeah. And so I think we gotta stop saying stuff like that. Like, oh, I'm not a, I'm not a body with a soul. I'm a soul with a body. No, 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 you are soul and body. Mm -hmm. You are material and immaterial and both parts of you matter to God, okay? Yeah. But again, upon death, the body goes into the ground and the soul immediately goes into the presence of God mm -hmm. and we stay there until the return of Christ. We're in heaven, if you will, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, another phrase for that, this is the intermediate state, all right? It's almost like a waiting room, you know? We're there in the presence of God, waiting for Christ to come and finish his work. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what happens after the believer in Christ dies. And then one day in the future, we have no idea when, Christ will return. Uh, that Jesus, our resurrected king, will come off his throne in heaven and he will return to planet earth and he will take over and he will set all things right and he will crush all of his enemies and the final enemy to be defeated will be death mm -hmm. and that the world will be subjected to his rule and reign. Sin and all of its consequences will be no more. Like everything we hate about life in the world's gone forever, yeah. man. All right, so question. Yeah. So it, when you die, yeah, you're in the presence of God, mm -hmm. and that's the waiting room, mm -hmm. right? Okay, mm -hmm. just making sure because I know a lot of people get yeah. confused about yep. that. Like, yep. is there this like spot in between? No or something purgatory. Like that? We don't believe okay, that. Cool. Okay, cool. We're just not, making we're, sure. not, we're not Catholics. Yeah. we don't believe in purgatory. So when you die, presence of God. That's you exactly are, right. And now mm -hmm. with God, we're waiting yep. on Jesus to return. That's right. All right. I mean, that's good to clear up because yeah, a lot yeah, yeah. of people think, think that. That's a great question, and and the difference would be that 
that purgatory is a waiting room, mm -hmm. a, a person within Catholic belief goes to purgatory because they need to be further purged of their sin. Yeah. And we would say, no, mm -hmm. you don't. Yeah. Jesus took care of that at the cross, man. Mm -hmm. That his sufficient, at, excuse me, his sacrifice at Calvary was sufficient to atone for the sins of man fully. Yeah. No, that's good. That he purged sin from us. He purified us. Mm -hmm. And so we don't need to go to a place to be purged of sin. A person has purged us from sin. His name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we don't need that, okay? Again, what happens is that, that we go immediately in the presence of God. That's the waiting room. We stay there until the future return of Christ, okay? I like it. And so he comes back. Mm -hmm. He redeems. He renews his world. Um, I've often said, too, that the beauty of this is, is on this day, we don't need hospitals. We don't need jails. We don't need police officers. We don't need firefighters. We don't need paramedics. We don't need funeral homes. Mm. Um, gosh, man, all, all the things yeah, that doctors, nurses, vaccines, medicine, like yeah. it all goes away. It all goes away because sin and all of its consequences go away. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about the very things that exist in our world to deal with the effects of sin, those are no more, mm -hmm. which is incredible to think about, right? That this is what awaits us. And so when Christ returns and takes over and sets all things right, the world begins to look very different under his rule and reign. And what happens then is he resurrects people, okay? Mm -hmm. And I believe that a general resurrection will take place after the return of Christ. We see this in John 5, that there's coming a day when all will come out of their tombs, is what he says, mm -hmm. both believers and unbelievers, okay? So it's not just people who know Christ, it's also people who don't know Christ that will be resurrected. Mm -hmm. Those of us who know him, we will be resurrected to life. Those of us who don't, resurrected to judgment, okay? And so I'll talk about judgment here in just a moment. But the beauty of this resurrection is that if we know Jesus, we get brand new bodies mm -hmm. that don't get sick, that don't feel pain, that never die. And our hope is that we will live in those physical bodies with Jesus in this new world for eternity. Man, that's and so be in good. a sense, he's going to take us back to how life was, was intended to be before mm -hmm. sin ever entered the world. And so this is what we look forward to. Now, as far as judgment, um, after we are resurrected from the dead we will all be judged by Jesus. Mm. Again, this is John 5, that the Father has entrusted the work of judgment to the Son. Mm. And so as individuals, we will stand before the Son, the Savior of the world, the King of heaven and earth, and we will give an account for how we spent the one life that he gave us. Mm -hmm. The beauty for the believer is that we will be judged based on his work, not ours, mm -hmm. okay? We'll be judged by the fact that we trusted in him as the one who suffered the penalty for our sin. And so we stand before him as not guilty people anymore. That's mm -hmm. great. That's yeah. really good news, okay? And so what, what judgment means for the believer in Christ is that we'll be rewarded mm -hmm. by him for our faithfulness, for the work that we did in his name, what all that looks like. I mean, we're not entirely sure. The Bible doesn't give us all the specifics. Yeah. But we know that in some way we will be rewarded for how we spent life here on earth in the body, for what we did for the sake of Jesus Christ, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, for the unbeliever, they will be judged on the basis of their rejection. Mm -hmm. So think about this, man. The unbeliever will stand before Jesus as mm -hmm. the person who rejected his sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't need you to save me from the penalty of my sin. And so for the unbeliever, they will suffer that penalty mm -hmm. for all of eternity away from the presence of God which is heartbreaking. And, and it's why we are in the world on mission yeah. is to announce that there's no reason for that. Like why in the world, after what he's done to save sinners, would you reject his sacrifice? Put your faith in him, give your life to him. He has good things for you. He has a future for you, a hope for you, man, right? Like mm -hmm. he wants to save you from that. But for the person who would say in this life, I don't want it and I don't need it. Well, they'll stand before Jesus and he'll go, okay. I'm gonna give if, you what you want. Yeah, if if uh, if you didn't want me and what I did for you, then now you get to suffer that on your own. And so the unbeliever will be judged on the basis of their rejection of Christ. And so judgment takes place. And then after this, what we know to be true from the scriptures is that Jesus Christ will usher in the new heavens and the new earth, okay? So this is cosmic redemption. 
that it's not just our bodies that will experience a resurrection from the dead. The earth itself will experience a resurrection. Mm. So Carlos, if you think about this, man, and Paul talks about it in Romans 8, if you want to go read that text, but if you think about this, like like creation itself is currently tainted by sin, Mm -hmm. that creation itself feels the effects of sin, and we even see it in ways. We see natural disasters, we see weather events, we see earthquakes, we see uh, volcanic eruptions, we like all this crazy stuff going on in the world, which which I take to to be what Paul means when he talks about creation groaning, that it is longing for redemption, right? Mm-hmm. And so even creation knows that it needs Christ to do something for it to set it free. Mm-hmm. That's just wild, right? That is crazy. And so there's coming a day when he will set creation free. And what I find fascinating about this is like. You think about the most beautiful mountain range you've ever seen, the most beautiful beach you've ever seen. Even that has sin on it. And so to think about what the new heavens and the new earth might be like, just in terms of sheer beauty, it's mind-blowing. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. And and this is the place where we will live with King Jesus for eternity. Mm. Under his rule and reign, free from not only the penalty and power of sin, but the presence of sin. And we will know life in the way that God intended us to know life. Mm. So hope. That's why we have hope yeah. as believers in Christ. Because we know that, that death doesn't get the final word. And we know that anything that we face in this life right now pales in comparison to what we will one day experience. Mm. That like we can't compare the human experience now to the glory that will one day be revealed to us. And so like all the pain, all the suffering, all the stuff we go through in life, like at the end of the day, pushing through that, persevering to the end is worth it because of what we know awaits us. Mm. I mean, I've said this many, many times in my preaching that that Christianity is a belief system radically oriented toward the future. And if we really wanna live as people filled with hope, We've got to look toward these things. Mm. We've got to look out to the end and go, okay, I know that's what's coming. And so no matter what fa- what I face in this life, I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm not abandoning Jesus. I'm going to endure and push through and persevere because I know that's what awaits me because of what he's done for me. Mm-hmm. And so as believers, we know that this is as close to hell as we're ever going to get. Praise God that the best is always yet to come. We always have something to look forward to no matter how dark things might seem. And so we persevere yeah, and we remain hopeful people because in the end, Jesus wins. Mm. That's the good news of Easter. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good, man. That's so good. Uh, the only thing I would add would be that's why we follow Jesus. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. I do think that the practices, uh, the the you could call them the holy mm-hmm. habits, they, they kind of remind you of those things. That's right. You know, they remind you of this future hope that we have. When you read the Bible, I mean, you're going to learn about it. Yeah. You know, Um, and when you sit under biblical teaching, they're going to tell you about it. So when you practice these things, you're reminded of it every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can fix your eyes and focus, you know, on Jesus and where he's at because that's where you're going to be. That's right. Um, But that's awesome, man. I hope, I hope somebody can definitely hear that. Yes. just believe that. Yep. Yeah, you know, that'll change your life. That's it. Well, and, and I think that's a good place to to bring the thing to an end, to land the plane to, is that, man, if you need that hope, believe. Mm. Believe in Christ. Give your life to him. Present yourself to him in faith. Ask him to be your savior. Surrender to his lordship. Right? Yeah. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord, and you will be saved, is what Paul says. And so if you need that hope, give your life to Jesus today and it will change everything. Absolutely. Man, that's beautiful, man. Well, that is a good place to stop it. So yeah. happy Easter. Hey, we love you guys, man. Thank you guys for listening. And as you go, we just want you to know that we love you. We're here for you and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Pursuit with James Griffin. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll never miss an episode. If you have questions about the message, the scriptures, or faith in general, you can send them to us by texting the word QUESTION to the number 22722. For more information about our church or this podcast, please visit crosspointcity.com or follow us online at Crosspoint City. If you found value in this podcast, we would love it if you took time to like it and share it with a friend. Doing that will help more people know and follow Jesus. And finally, we want to invite you to join us each week for one of our gatherings in person or live on YouTube. We hope to see you soon.